The Bellator cage is back in Dublin, Ireland this week. This beautiful city which is full to the brim with passionate fight fans. It is a place that never disappoints. It's a place of lyricism and artistry, but also of wondrous noise and spectacular drama. And Benson Henderson takes on Peter Queeley, both hoping to stake their claim to a shot at the Bellator lightweight title. It promises to be a terrific fight on a terrific night here at the Three Arena. John McCarthy, of course, will watch it all with me, Dave Farah. And John, I know that we can't wait for this entire prelim card, the main card too, but let's focus on that main event. That main event is awesome because they match up so well and they do things in such a similar fashion, but they each have their strong points and it's who could keep the fight in that area that I think is going to walk away with the win. When you're looking at Benson Henderson, you're talking about look at the knees he throws. It's the variety of his attack and he's super heavy with the legs, but his submission game is outstanding and I think that's where he has the edge in this matchup. If this fight hits the ground, he will turn a bad position like you're seeing right now against Mamadov into a good position where he almost cranks off the submission. He's a guy that is called smooth for a reason, but Queeley is what I call the working man's fighter. He just keeps coming. He's durable. He never stops. He has this Irish crowd in his hand. And when it gets to the ground, this is what he likes to do. You want to hit the ground with him? He's going to still hit you with elbows, hit you with shots, and make you wish that you never took him there. So this is a matchup. Both guys are outstanding. I can't wait to see this fight go down. Doesn't it just set it up perfectly? What a night we've got in front of us. Let's take a look at the rest of the main card. The co-main, Yoel Romero, Melvin Manhoff. We cannot wait for that one. A big test for Leah McCourt. He'll be much loved inside this three arena. She takes on Diana Silva. Mads Vanell, a real rising star, looking to bounce back from that Boric defeat against Pedro Carvalho. He'll be roared into this place, as will Kieran Clark. He'll kick off that main card against the a late replacement who has a chance to change his life, Rafael Utsun. We'll kick off the prelims though with the welterweights. To get us underway, yeah, ahead of a great looking card at the Three Arena, a high level matchup the Dublin based Moldovan Luca Poklit and Dante Skiro. And now, ladies and gentlemen, ready to make his way to the cage, Luca Pocleet. This tough man from Moldova, Luca Pocleet, now fighting out of SBG Island here in Dublin, has twice been disappointed when he thought he was on the brink of his Bellator debut. The first time because of COVID, the second due to an injured opponent. That makes tonight all more special for him and it's been some journey to get here a difficult childhood salvation through wrestling and now a set of skills that see him get a chance in Bellator and like so many of these fighters John a chance he's determined to take you're talking about a guy he lost his first MMA fight since that point he's undefeated 7-0 from that point his wrestling is outstanding he has talked about I've been waiting too long for this I get a little anxious because I've waited so long but now comes the time he's got a great opponent he gets a win against Dante Skiro that's a big step forward and now we welcome his opponent Dante Skiro well Dante Skiro is a good guy an unassuming guy but even he might be forgiven for wondering what he's doing opening the prelim show here tonight two fights ago on his Bellator debut he lost by a split decision against Logan Storley and that looks to be a pretty good line of form right now last time he grabbed the first Bellator win he's nine and three and should he win tonight there'll be opportunities for him higher up the fight card but his mind is on tonight but what a start to bring him into the game I'll tell you what Dante Skiro comes in with a rest wrestling background but it's his striking and his jujitsu that is really impressive. Here he was in Hawaii and just putting on a great performance, wearing his opponent down, breaking him down to the point where he could no longer 
be involved in the fight. The fight was called. That was his first Bellator win coming off of that Logan Storley split decision loss. But his ground game is outstanding. So if Luca takes the fight down there, man, it is not going to be an easy go. The tail of the tape between the welterweights, Luca Pocleet and Dante Skiro. And John, you want to look at that five-year age gap. You know, that's really the only difference that you'll see if you take a look at these highlights. It is that Dante Skiro is the younger fighter, and Luca has been waiting for this fight. Has time caught up? I don't think so. At 33, he's still young. This is a great matchup. Well, time now for the first time this evening to hear from our Bellator Master of Ceremonies, of course, Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Three Arena as Bellator MMA is back in Dublin, Ireland tonight. Bellator 285 gets underway now. The prelims start with three five-minute rounds in the welterweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at six foot, weighing in 169.7 pounds. His professional record, seven wins, one loss by way of Moldova. He fights out of Dublin, Ireland, presenting Luca Pocleet. And across the cage, his adversary, out of the red corner, at six foot one, weighing in 169.9 pounds as a professional. Nine victories, three defeats, fighting out of Denver, Colorado, by way of Madison, Wisconsin, USA, presenting Dante. Skiro in charge, your referee Brian Miner. Well, there's been so much talk about tonight, about what's going to happen all through this terrific prelim card, and then, of course, into that stacked main card. It just feels like a thrill to get things underway, as we've said, with a really High-level fight, Luca Pocleet, the Moldovan from SBG Island in the blue gloves against Dante Skiro, who feels that he might just be going places. Luca Pocleet is very aggressive in his style. When you watch him, he starts to get comfortable in the fight. He's always coming forward, always trying to do damage. Dante Skiro is the guy, man, he's going to stay on the outside. He's going to move. He's going to give you different looks. But he, his, his defensive wrestling is really good. And when the fight hits the ground, look for him to li really look for submissions if he's underneath. Hit a cautious stand up just to start things off here. Both looking for those early inside leg kicks. Skiro actually landed uh, a couple of good early leg kicks. A bit more tentative from uh, Pocleet. I know a lot of people, by the way, close to the sport here in Ireland have been really looking forward to seeing Luca Pocleet. There was quite a lot of, uh, of gym talk about him. Been waiting so long, of course, for this debut. That was a really nice uppercut by Dante Skiro with the left hand. Caught Luca a little off guard. He's got him a little confused right now. You can see it just by the mannerisms of Luca if you've seen him with the range of what's going on. It was a good kick to the body there from Luca Pocleet. Skiro said he, he thought he mixed things up pretty well last time, previously against Storley. I think he felt he showed him too much respect. He'd watched him wrestle in college and was maybe a little bit overawed by him. It was just like you saw right there when you saw Skiro go to the body. He needs to up the progression of that. Don't just hit him with one shot. Go with the combinations. Hit that one, two, three, four. That's where you're going to see a lot of success. He's been lining up that leg kick. That's the most accurate. The most wearing so far from Skiro. Skiro's been very accurate with that low calf kick, and you can already see the marks on Ket's leg. As John mentioned at the start, Pakleet lost on his debut in Romania against Marabek Tysimov, but seven wins since. Again, that calf kick from Skiro. And Landing almost in the same spot every time. That's exactly what I was going to do. And beautiful accuracy, and it was in almost the same spot. Use the sweep as well. Use your legs. Now, Pakleet's got his hands together. That usually is going to end up meaning you're going to get that takedown. We'll see what Skiro can do on the ground. He's already got wrist control. 
Folkley doing a nice job of trying to step himself over. Folkley has that strong wrestling background. Skiro, I know you've always been impressed with the work he can do off his back. Many times when you get a guy that's got a wrestling background, they're so uncomfortable with being off their back, they just never get really good with it, and he has. That, that was a really beautiful pass right there by Poclet. Skiro said beforehand that Poclet has cardio and grit, but he may not be the most skillful. I guess he's going to start to find out. Pressure on the neck there from Luca Poclet. Paul Cleet is really looking for that topside guillotine, and you're seeing the legs of Dante Skiro keep him at that distance where he can't close in, and that was a beautiful reversal by Dante Skiro. And that's what I was talking about. On the ground, he is slick. Yeah, Paul Cleet was just trying to attack that arm, trying to isolate, but Skiro was having none of that. Skiro can move into a Von Flew choke with where he's at right now. He's not even thinking about it, though, because that arm would be trapped. If he would bring his right arm underneath, he's more looking for an arm triangle choke. Skiro just trying to maneuver himself into that position. Well, he's got the position. What he's trying to do is keep that arm and, and secure that arm up against the head of Poclete. If he can get that arm there, no, he's decided doesn't have it. It was too much. He takes them out. Now, Poclete did a great job of reversing the position, but Dante Skiro right away takes the back. He hooks the leg over. This is not a good position for Poclete. Yeah, Poclete's in a terrible position now. Skiro looking for those elbows. Didn't feel he could get the choke in. And you can tell on the ground, Skiro is just a step ahead of Poclete. That's good opening round. Good high-level stuff there from Skiro. Some of the action from that opening round, John. That, yeah. Those early kicks from Skiro. Look at where that hit, right on the meaty part of that calf, if there is a meaty part of the calf. And then he ends up hitting it again multiple times. This was a beautiful takedown by Poclete. He gets it to the ground, but bad things started to happen on the ground with Skiro. And we talked about the skill level of Dante Skiro on the ground. He showed that he is a step ahead throughout all the maneuvers that you're seeing. And that's got to right now in, in Luca Poclete's head. He's got to be thinking, man, this guy's a lot different than I thought on the ground. Cody Donovan, uh, the word for Dante Skiro from Madison, Wisconsin, but based in Denver, Colorado. Round two, then. Poclete uh, said uh, that uh, he wants the fight to last as long as possible. So uh, proud of his cardio. And one of those who loves being in there fighting. Any questions about how you would score that opening round, John? First time I'm going to ask you that tonight. Uh, that, that was an easy round if you're going to be scoring it. That goes to Dante Skiro, 10-9. He was the guy that had the better positions, controlled the fight where he wanted, landed good kicks, a couple of nice shots to the body. Should be his round. Easy round to open. I'm promising it's going to get tougher. <laughs> a whole lot tougher. <laughs> But if you're Luca Paclete, at this point, you've lived your entire MMA career off your ability to wrestle, take people down, and grind on them. Your first opportunity to do that against Skiro did not go as planned. You had problems. So is he going to go back to trying to take it down? And he is. He did it nice, neatly, and effectively. Skiro is looking for the, to take a look where his arm is. Beautiful switch right there that he's trying to pull off. A lot of pressure down on Poclete's shoulder. Goes back to that point you were making in the first round that Skiro just feels like he's that half a second ahead all the time in terms of thought processes. 
Luca going after that. I, when you don't have your legs involved in that guillotine choke, it's very difficult to get. Skiro doing a nice job lacing that arm. Look how he's taking his right arm, taking the, the right arm of Poklit. He's controlling it now so he can open up with his left hand. Skiro has been beaten three times, but two of those were via split decision. Skiro made a very good attempt at taking the back. Luca was right with him, rolled through with it, got top position. Both guys now on the ground. Both guys showing a lot of slick movement. But again, you notice how high Luca ends up getting. Pokleet's getting too high on Skiro. That's where you've seen Skiro dip his head in. He's getting so high. Going for the guillotine, arm and guillotine attempt. He does not have it. It's tight, but Skiro is in a position you can tell by where his head's at. He can, he's getting some air. You know, the crowd are getting excited by it, but Skiro always felt like he was in control of that. And you got to figure how much energy did Pokleet use there? How, how gassed is his arms? It wasn't on that long. But Dante moves sliding right into Mount. Beautiful movement. He's trying to defend that. Well, Pokleet was able to actually turn this position one time already. Skiro just trying to free his arms so he can do some damage here. You see him moving his knees up underneath the, going towards being underneath the armpits of Pokleet. That's going to put a lot of pressure. It's going to take his hips out of the game also. Big Spoke elbow. Spoke before about Pokleet's cardio, how proud he is of it. He better be right now because this is taking a lot out of him. It, 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 but you're also going against a guy in Skiro who comes from Colorado, trains at elevation. You could look at both guys. Neither one was hardly breathing as the second round started. Beautiful movement by Dante Skiro. Pokleet going for that reversal. Skiro going with him. High head in this position is usually the one that's going to come out on top. It's that fight IQ, isn't it, of, of Dante Skiro here. These guys are locked up inside. I love what I'm seeing right now because they're both knowing. Skiro wants to pop his head out. Pokleet wants to. Is that neither guy can do it. There it comes once it comes up into up to the top. He's out. Wow. Wow. Brian Miner saw it. So much pressure there. Almost pressure on both of them. You can see the state they're in. You're talking about a position. Both guys were in position. They were getting choked, but it was obvious now that Pokleets was a better hold. He had a deeper and more squeeze on it and was able to put Dante Skiro out. Look at the trouble that Pokleet's in here. That shows what a strange situation it was almost. Skiro was still down and of course the doctor's tending to him, but here it is again, John. And as he turns here, look at Dante Skiro, but he ends up where Pokleet has his head. Notice where his arm's at across. You see Skiro having his arm crossing over into his neck. That's the choke that you're seeing from Poquette. And then all of a sudden, it almost looked like Dante, no, he didn't tap that with Brian Miner moving his hand. He just went to sleep. Skiro's okay. He's sitting up now. Well, Poquette, I mentioned there was a lot of excitement around him. And people were looking forward to seeing him and seeing how he came out of that SBG gym on Bellator debut. And big smile on the face of John Kavanagh there because that is a, a really good start from Luca Pocleet. And it's a big disappointment too for Dante Skiro. And it's good to see him uh, sitting up and talking to his team here. That's one of those when you, you're in it, you think, I'm going to be okay, I'm going to be okay, I'm squeezing, I'm going to be okay. And just all of a sudden, people are waking you up and, say, and you're going, what happened? 
Well, it's a fourth defeat for him. We'll come back from that. Lessons learned and all of that, but disappointment for Dante Skira. <laughs> the world, though, is Luca Poclitz's oyster at the moment. I think a lot of people are going to look forward to seeing him again. Being put under pressure, but in the end, he did what fighters do. He found a way. This is why we talk about being in the scramble, never giving up, never giving into that, because in that scramble, anything can happen. And that's what we just saw. Let's make things official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end officially. Four minutes, 31 seconds into round number two. The modified arm triangle, now called the Lucanator, puts it to a stop. The winner by technical submission, Luca Paclis. So, a Bellator debut and a win for Luca Paclis. Technical submission in round number two gets the win over Dante Skiro. Now, for the first time this evening, let's hand to our friend and colleague, Aidan Power. Thank you, friend and colleague, Dave Farrah. It's so good to be back here in my hometown of Dublin, K-side for Bellator 285. What a way to start our show, and how will it end tonight? In our main event, the fans are in for a treat because Benson Henderson is back on Irish soil. He is looking for another world title. World title number three. Can it be his first in Bellator? Well, he's got to get past Ireland's Peter Queeley, the much beloved son. So, Benson arrives here off the back of a very important win over Islam Mamadov, a rejuvenating win as he described it. He's just signed a new four-fight contract, and he says there is plenty of gas still in the tank. A combination of his 39-fight experience and his pace will be the difference tonight. Well, for Peter Queeley, who's ranked seventh in the division, as he says, it's been a frustrating and challenging 10 months, losing to Patricky Pitbull here in Dublin, then having to sit out the show in February with a rib injury, and then undergoing shoulder surgery. But he is back, and he is promising a 25-minute war against Benson Henderson tonight and we know folks it's going to be an incredible main event before it even starts what about that walkout whatever you're doing today tonight this evening make sure you do not miss that walkout it's going to be incredible Dave thanks very much indeed Aiden he's not wrong you know time now for an explosive match at featherweight between a supreme stand-up guy and Azela Juge and the multi-talented Jordan Barton who had a great win in Paris last time out and now, ready to make his way to the cage, Jordan Barton. Well, Jordan Barton says that he's never been in a dull fight. And from what these Dublin fans have seen of him, there'd be no argument at all. The last time he was here, and what was a great night of action, he was in that topsy-turvy war against Kieran Clark, which he really threw away in round three. And he's since bounced back against Fabakari Diatta in Paris in May. An outstanding and dominant display. And Jordan Barton is one of those interesting fighters, John. There's so much talent there. He is really outstanding everywhere. His stand-up is so sharp, so clean. He got caught by a guy in Karen Clark that is a specialist in a certain position. He got the back. He was able to get that choke in. Jordan was able to stop it. But every time we have watched him, just like he says, he is never in a boring fight. So this should be outstanding. This is the time he might be fighting someone who's even more skilled in that stand-up area. And now to make his way, I said a judge. Hassel Ajuj heads into the Bellator cage for the third time and does so off the back of three consecutive wins. His Bellator journey started with a defeat against Konstantin Vanitsa back in 2020. Then he got back on track. And now this talented fighter from a serious kickboxing background hopes to continue his self-prescribed journey to be the next big thing in MMA. All the talent in the world, this guy. Boy, he is so slick in the stand-up. That's why I was saying Jordan Martin is outstanding. But this this guy does some things at times you go, oh my God, that was done so well, so fast. It might be good for Jordan to try to take him down, but you know, 
a Jew just came to Ireland to be with SBG, to get his ground game up to snuff, to be a great MMA fighter. We're gonna see if he can handle what Jordan Martin can bring. The tail of the tape between the featherweights are Sela Juge and Jordan Barton. And John, that reach differential could end up being absolutely key. Especially with the speed of a Juge. 71.5 to 68. We'll see if it makes that difference. Let's get to Michael C. Williams. From here at 3 Arena, we'd like to welcome all those joining us live on Virgin here in Ireland as the prelims move down to three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot ten, weighing in 146 pounds even. His professional record: seven wins, two losses, one draw from Manchester, England, Jordan Barton. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 146 pounds as a professional. Three victories, one loss, fighting out of Dublin, Ireland. Introducing a set of Juge. In charge, your referee, Kevin McDonald. There could be fireworks here. Wouldn't take your eyes off this one. A Juge will want this on the feet. Can Jordan Barton, a few people have said, could he put his ego aside here and <laughs> do the right thing to win the fight? Or will he try and bang a Juge out? Will he try and prove he's better on his feet? Let's see, John. I don't think Jordan Barton has ever backed down from a fight or a challenge, so I think we're going to see him on the feet for a while here. Only when you talk around the, the fight hotel and talk around the venue, you get a sense of what people think. And there are so many split opinions about this fight, about what they should both do, about who's going to come out on top. Beautiful kick and then a return with the counter of the right hand up by Jordan Barton. Juice describes himself as fighting out of Dublin by way of Marseille, the son of an Algerian immigrant in France. The only thing he ever liked was fighting, and he's become very, very slick, very good at it, particularly with those kicks. But Barton looks to take it down. That's what so many people wanted to see from him. This is what we were talking about. Was Jordan Barton going to let his ego get involved, or was he going to use Fight IQ to take him down when the opportunity presented itself and use what is actually a superior ground game at this point of their careers? But a juge getting back to his feet. This is what he's been learning at SBG. Nice foot sweep to take him right back down. felt like a, a little fight within the fight. Well, at least the one thing it's doing for Barton, even though he didn't keep him down there, it's telling a juice, yep, he's going he's to try to take him down. So he's got to be thinking about that and all the little feints inside he's got to react to. So if Barton looks for, you know, a change of levels and all of a sudden you see the hands of a juice going down, he might bring something over the top. A Juge constantly switches his stance, and you've got to be so careful when you do that not to get caught square. The kick, though, from a Juge, that landed. One of the things when you're watching a Juge, watch most of his hand strikes, all straight shots. They get there fast, and they're getting there in a straight line. I'm trying to land that jab. Such an important punch in fights like this. Really high paced, high energy. A lot of opening pressure. half of the opening round here. Martin doing the right thing, stepping into that spinning attack. Martin got touched on that. He was It's one thing knowing what you can do. It's another doing it under pressure like that against a top opponent. You saw all that forward pressure that Jordan was bringing. But let's take a look at, there was a shot that landed here. And I said, uh, he's hurt. 
Watch this straight shot. Look, the hook right there. I thought it was first with the left hand, and then the right hook. That hurt Martin. Martin should have given ground at this point. Kick up high. Lands beautifully. Look at the legs go stiff. He's able to at least control his fall, but when he hits the ground, he just starts to cover up. A juge goes after him. Referee Kevin McDonald makes a good stop on a fight that did not last that long. It's a clinical finish from Isaiah Juge. And he talked so much after that Konstantin Blanita fight about doing things wrong, about making the wrong decisions, not showing off his skills. He was desperate to come here and prove that he could do it. Rebuilt a bit over in Abu Dhabi, and he has come bursting back onto the scene here. He put on a beautiful performance against a guy that was putting a lot of pressure, knew what he could do, and just bided his time, got his opportunity, took it. Smiling conversation between Azale Ajuj and John Kavanagh. Well, that's so disappointing for Jordan Barton after the defeat by Kieran Clark to bounce back the way he did against Fabakari Diata and then to just be caught by that high kick, wonderfully accurate. And Barton beaten, but he'll be back. And he does say he's never in a dull fight and he's not wrong, it just didn't last very long. But you wonder about Azale Ajuj and where he might go next. That moves into two and one in the Bellator cage, four and one overall. And you just sense he might be a fighter who just gets better and better. Well, let's get to Michael C. Williams now to make it official. Ladies and gentlemen, it comes to an end officially. Two minutes, 39 seconds into round number one. The winner by TKO, Asen Ajuj. Terrific win that for Azel Ajuj. Going to see so much more of him, but let's get it up now to Big John. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with the the Jude. You put on a beautiful performance. You had a guy going after you with a lot of pressure. You knew he was trying to take you down at times, but you stayed relaxed. You threw a lot of straight shots. What was going through your head during that part of the first round? Yeah, first round I knew that he was going to come aggressive. So that was, I was like kind of figuring out first. Then I saw the opening, I walked out with my since I'm a kid, I'm training striking with my dad there. And now with Dare Roach, when I'm in Ireland, we worked a lot on the check hook, look down, head kick. And that's just what happened tonight. Alhamdulillah, I'm very happy. And I want to thank John Kavanaugh as well. With him, I will never be there. And all of the people are supporting me. Thanks and good luck to all of my teammates from SBG tonight. Well, that was a fantastic finish. Congratulations on a big win. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Asada Juj. Terrific win for Azel Ajuj. There's that SBG team and a proud father as well. That will be a picture for the family album and who knows where his career might go next. So plenty of action already here tonight in Dublin. And of course, a lot of action coming your way.
two of Bellator's biggest stars co headline the most stacked fight card of the year. Time to let me off with my leash. Patricio Pitbull makes his featherweight title defense versus lightning quick Adam Boric. Push the button. Plus, AJ McKee moves the lightweight to face upset minded Spike Carlisle. So It's Pitbull versus Borch and McKee versus Carlisle. Bellator MMA, Saturday, October 1st, live on Showtime. From the gym to the streets, Bellator fans head to bellatorshop.com and gear up in the same apparel the fighters wear. Bellator brings the brawlers to the raucous atmosphere at Dublin's Three Arena. Benson Henderson steps into enemy territory against hometown hero Peter Quilly. Plus, light heavyweight Yoel Romero is on a mission of destruction. But Melvin Manhoff wants to go out on top in the final fight of his storied career. What a finish! Bellator MMA, today, live from Dublin, on Showtime. It is fast incoming from Dublin, Ireland. Bellator 285, our 5 fight main card kicks off at 9 o'clock local time. That's 4 o'clock Eastern in the States. And in our co-main event, two of the most exciting and dynamic and explosive knockout artists we have ever seen go toe-to-toe -to -toe and fist-to-fist. -fist. Yoel Romero is taking on Melvin Manhoff. This fight has been talked about for a long, long time. It was finally made in May on that night in Paris. We saw Romero just just toying with Alex Pelizzi to send a reminder to everyone of his supreme strength, ability, and indeed power. That message was not only for Melvin Manhoff, but also for everyone at 185, because that is where Romero told us he is headed next, his beloved division. But tonight, he wants to take the scalp of a legend. For Manhoff, there may be no return. This most likely will be it for one of the most dangerous and scary and frightening fighters in all of mixed martial Arts. He has knocked out 29 of 32 opponents, and what a way to cap off an incredible career by claiming win number 30 over a legend in the Soldier of God, Yoel Romero. Whatever happens, it is going to be a shootout here in Dublin. You do not want to miss it. Dave. You certainly don't want to miss that. That is going to be something, Romero against Manhoff, but... We're going to see the latest talent from SBG Island. That's quite a good night for them already. Kenny Mokonwana makes his Bellator debut. He's up against another promotional debutant in the shape of Alex Bodnar. And now making his way to the cage, Alex Bodnar. Well, the Slovakian Alex Budner makes his way to the Bellator cage for the first time. As we always say of a fighter on their Bellator debut, a real chance to make a statement to leap further towards the center of the picture. Six foot tall, which will give him a height and reach advantage more often than not at 145 pounds. He's going to try and make that work to his advantage tonight against a fellow debutant. He might just have his hands full, though. Yeah, he's a very well-rounded fighter. He's got good stand-up. He understands the ground. Comes up with submission wins. This is a fight where normally you're talking about his height, and he does have the advantage. This is one time he does. And now his opponent, Kenny Mokonohama. So Kenny Mokonwana believes that he can become the best featherweight on the planet and change his family's life. And that journey for him starts here as one of the latest fighters from that production line at SBG Island. And he begins his journey to his destiny. Fight number four, he comes here with a 3-0 record. And now, for all the talk, it is up to him. All that talk, but you know what? He has backed up everything that he said. He's got three wins, all by submission. He's very good on the ground. He uses his length very well. This is one where both six foot tall in the featherweight division. This is going to be a good one. The tail of the tape for the featherweights, Kenny Mokonwana and Alex Bodner, both mating their Bellator debuts, and you picked out their records to take a look at. Just to say, they're both very young fighters, even go by the age, but 3-0, 4-1-1, one one, 
guys are looking to impress so they can move on with their careers and get to the point where they're getting those title shots. Let's get to the cage, shall we? And to Michael C. Williams. And as the prelims continue here in Ireland, we welcome all those streaming live tonight on YouTube at Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports as we go now to three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Fighting first out of the blue corner at six foot, weighing in 145.6 pounds as a professional. Four wins, one loss, one draw by way of Slovakia. He fights out of Portsmouth, England, Alhead. Across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 146 pounds, even as a professional. He stands undefeated at three and oh, fighting out of Dublin, Ireland. Can he? In charge, your referee Brian Minor. Thank you. You always get this sense when we're here in Dublin that the, the fans really start to come in round about this point, start to pack the place out already, and you could hear that Ready? with those Ready? cheers Ready? for Kenny Mock on one. They know their stuff here, they know who they're supporting. Bonna has not just Mock on one to deal with, but this crowd as well. He's just got to put all that with the crowd behind. They're not in the cage, so. Deal with what you have in front of you, and that's Kenny Mokodwana. John said all three of his wins have come by submission, and that's where he wants it, and that's where he gets it here. Nice job of stepping over the leg there by Mokodwana. Puts his back flat to the canvas. Nice and relaxed, taking his time, looking for heavy elbow strikes. Smart to go to the elbow strikes right away. Real strength from Mokodwana trying to force his way into that new position if he can. Very nice job by Bodner to get himself back into the full guard. He's trying to control posture here. Nice foot on the hip. That allows him to be able to swing into the different submission attacks. from Jim 101 in, down in uh, in Portsmouth. Brian Adams does a really good job down there. Well-rounded fighters that he produces. Bodnar will have known what to expect here. Mokonwana really needs to get his right hand off of the ground. Having your hand on the ground there only allows Bodnar to have the ability to trap that. Good head position there, isn't it, from Mokonwana? Just Very nice use of his head. And the pressure into the chin there of Bodnar. You see Bonner bringing both of those legs together. It's like, you know, you want to separate them. Finally got him separated there. Get himself back, gets the underhook. You hear the voice there of uh, Brian Adams just telling him to use those underhooks. Knees there from Mokonwano. Trying to let his hands go here. Nice kick out by Bodner. Gonna be careful with that neck position though, Bodner. Biggest problem right now is you can see Bodner's got that position as far as look at how Mokonwana is pressing in on that neck. He's gonna end up going out. He's out. He's out. And with Alex Bodnar, who's slowly coming to here, but will need attention. When we go back to showing what that submission was like, yes, it's a kitty, but watch how he takes and the positioning of his arms, and he's pressing his arm over. It's almost creating a scissor-like effect on the neck of Bodnar. See here, he doesn't have his hand. He's just got the one arm in, but then he takes his other hand, Notice how he presses it up into, look at how tight that is, and he's just forcing 
that to pinch off on the neck. That is super tight right now. Bodner at this point is in big trouble, and you'll watch him just go out. That little kick is him saying that's it, and he's out right there. Yeah, Brian Miner got himself into position to see, and Mokonwana emotional here. It's a big win that for him. There was pressure on him even as the favorite. He goes to four and oh. And he salutes this crowd as well. Bodner, you can see in the background now, up and sitting on his stool, rueful smile on his face. But they've got so many local favorites here, so many potential stars and I would say to you already what a night it is for John Kavanagh, Luca Pocleet in a 50-50, a Sailor Juge likewise and now well Kenny Mokonwana was expected to win but that was still seriously impressive from him. Bodnar was uh, holding his own wasn't he but it was that pressure and once Mokonwana had the neck he wasn't letting go. Let's get up now to make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, it comes to an end officially, two minutes, 42 seconds, round number one. The end comes by way of a guillotine by technical submission. He's still undefeated. Can he? He is going to rock it through the ranks, isn't he, Mark Onwana? We can hear from him now. Kind words for his opponent, but let's get up to Big John. All that time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am here with the winner, Kenny Mokonwana. That was a beautifully set up submission that a lot of people are not going to realize how you placed your hands, why it was so tight. Yeah. Even your opponent didn't kind of get an idea until it was too late. Yeah. Talk to me about how you felt in this cage. I won't lie. Um, it's a bit weird for me being here. Like, obviously, it's even weird for me talking to you, do you know what I mean? And um, it's, just a, it's a weird stage, so um, I wasn't... I don't feel like I got uh, very comfortable in there with my strikes and with my hands and that, but um, yeah, I got I got the job done. And anyways, you're saying with the finish, obviously, um, but you, obviously you want the elbow to be in, so it's on deep. So I made sure I quick that I got my uh, elbow in, or else I think a decent fight, a good fight like him would have got out of that. Talk to me about what the training at SBG has done for you as a fighter as far as your confidence coming in here. Um, 100% then. Um, obviously, I come from a great gym in Blanchardstown, Dublin. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, um, from there, obviously, John and Dave took me under their wing um, for my professional fights. And then, um, yeah, the little details make a big difference that they're showing me, and um, I'm o I've only been there just over a year, so uh, I'm only, I feel like most a baby, like, at, at, like where I'm at, do you know what I mean? Well, I'm a veteran, but I'm like, I'm, like, I'm a rookie on the vet, so um, yeah, we'll see what um, uh, they'll show me in the next few fights. They're definitely gonna be better than that, 100%. I'm, I'm better than what I showed, even though um, I didn't get to show much again. <laughs> You showed a lot. Let's, you came in here, you didn't take any damage. How fast do you want to get back in here with another fight? And as soon as possible, I hope. We'll see what happens. You know what I mean? I'll go back, talk to the team. I'll be even fight next week if, if possible. But um, yeah, let me just give me a week to get back to the, to get back to, back to Blanchestown, get back to my girlfriend there. Uh, yeah, bro, it doesn't matter. Big up the, big up the crowd, bro. I love you, yeah. yeah I, feel, I feel the energy. I love you, I believe. There he is, I. Yeah? Come on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Kenny Mokonwana. And they do put their hands together. They love him here, don't they? Just brilliant from him. Fantastic action so far. Of course, much more action coming your way.
The new Bellator MMA app is here. New look, new features, new fights. Watch live weigh-ins and prelims. Share your fight picks. Earn points and badges as you rank up to the heavyweight division. And stay up to date on events, rankings, and news. For all the latest features, download the new Bellator MMA app. Available on the App Store and Google Play. Bellator brings the brawlers to the raucous atmosphere at Dublin's Three Arena. Benson Henderson steps into enemy territory against hometown hero Peter Quilly. Plus, light heavyweight Yoel Romero is on a mission of destruction. But Melvin Manhoff wants to go out on top in the final fight of his storied career. What a finish! Bellator MMA, today, live from Dublin, on Showtime. And we are live right now from the Irish capital, Dublin City, bringing you the prelims of Bellator 285. And already, as you've seen, if you've been watching, they've got off to an oh-so-incredible start. I just got myself a souvenir, folks. Check that out. That's from our winner in the last fight, Kenny Mogamwana. It'll either go up online or I'll give it back to him. All right, it's been that kind of day already, and it's only going to get bigger and better here in Dublin. Slap bang in the middle of our main card this evening sees the return of Leah McCourt. We'll take on Brazil. Diana Silva. These are two top 10 featherweights with very contrasting styles and as we see McCord currently sits at number five. Silva not be far behind at number seven. For Leah McCord it has been a rapid rise in her pro career. The judo back black belt went on a very impressive six fight win streak and she's also the first female to headline a Bellator card in Europe. However that run came to a halt in this very arena in this very cage last February when she faced Sinead Kavanagh in one of the biggest all Irish fights in many years. She came out in the wrong end of a unanimous decision in a grueling contest that for many was fight of the night. Well, she has made changes. She now trains with Molly McCann and Paddy Pimlet in Liverpool. And as she told us, a change is as good as a rest. And she's coming in here for this one 100% fit and healthy for her opponent, Diana Silva. Well, she arrives here with a win over Janae Harding. She's already mixed it up with the former champ, Julia Budd, and indeed Arlene Blenko. And she believes her predominant striking style, her controlled aggression, and having her husband in the corner will be the difference tonight and she will be the one to silence this Irish crowd. It's going to be very exciting. That is just one of five great fights on our main card which starts at four on Showtime. Yeah, thanks, Aiden. Now you go backstage and give it back to him. That's our message from here. Go and give it. That's not going up online. Go and give it back to him, and we'll come back to you later on in the course of the evening. Now, I know that a lot of people were picking out our next fight as a fight of the night candidate. Georgie Kalahanian against Kane Musa at lightweight. It promises us so much. And now to make his way to the cage, Kane, the danger. Well, Georgie Callahanian says that he performs better when the pressure is on, and he's on a losing streak, having lost his last two against really good opponents. But that's where this 
37 year old is remarkable fighter as he steps into the Bellator cage for the 21st time and he wanted this fight he specifically asked for it John he thinks he can win it and himself make a statement here he did ask for this fight but in it lightweight because both of these guys used to be featherweights at lightweight I think we're gonna see a much better fight between both of them they both have their strong points in the game. Georgi Karhanian is outstanding on the ground. Black belt for, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and he's got a nasty, nasty guillotine choke that Kane has got to be careful of sticking his head into that hole. The tail of the tape between the lightweights, Georgi Karhanian and Kane Musa, who both bring a lot of experience into the cage. They John. do, and that's really what we're pointing out here is look at all of the experience Karhanian. K. Musa had that time in prison, so he wasn't able to fight for a while. But he has been busy, he is active, and this man is good. Time now for Michael C. Williams. Tonight here at Bellator 285, the prelims continue now as we go to the lightweight division, scheduled for three five-minute rounds. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot eight, weighing in 155.7 pounds. His professional record: 13 victories, four defeats. By way of Dragada, he fights out of Manchester, England. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot eight, weighing in 156 pounds even. The veteran professional brings 31 victories, 13 losses, one draw, fighting out of Riverside, California, USA, Georgie Insane In charge, your referee, Kerry Hetley. Well, John mentioned that guillotine of Karahanian. Let's just be clear, 14 of his 16 submission wins have come via choke. Six of those with that famous guillotine. Our and Musa four, four, needs to be right here, really, right? really right. careful of that. One of the key things to watch out for here, Kane Musa and Georgie Karahanian. Musa looking to throw that looping right hand. Question often of consistency with Kane Musa and keeping going for the full five minutes. A couple of good hooks there from Karahanian. Nice return by Musa too. Both guys throwing heavy leather right off the beginning. And that's the one thing you, you look at times where you, you're looking at a volume fight or something like that. Both Kane Musa and Karahanian both possess one punch knockout power. Good right hand, he set it up well as well there, Kane Musa closed the distance. Beautifully set up by that jab. Looks to the body as well, sensibly there, Musa just mixing things up, and then that leg kick landed well. You can see right now, look at how hard Georgia Carhanian is biting on some of the feints. That's telling you he's not real comfortable with what Kane's doing right now. Switches there, Karahanian says he's comfortable. Doing that, we know that in his long career. Good jab again there from Musa. Found his range early with that. Really good opening, 90 seconds. Karahanian flinging that right uppercut. Missed with it, though, by some distance. And Musa with a short right hook. He made Karahanian miss again there. And right there, what what Georgia needs to do instead of coming in with that one big shot set it up the same as we saw Musa in the beginning use that jab even if it's one time use that to set up make his hands get busy and then bring the power most underrated punch in boxing and indeed in the world of MMA that jab jab is king Good right hand there from Karahanian that stung Kane Musa that got his interest And both guys right now having a lot of energy, a lot of power going out there. But they need to both start getting into the point where they're starting to use combinations. And right now, Moose is the one that's going more towards that. He's at least throwing ones and twos. Georgie's really throwing ones. He's thinking well here, Musa. Using those kicks and using that jab. Trying to mix things up. Big right hand there from Musa. 
And then he throws that left iron chin, though, of Karahanian. You talk about iron chin of Karahanian. At 145, I always thought that Georgie was losing too much weight. You can see it would affect him. He wasn't able to take the same amount of damage at 155. No one's putting him away. He's much tougher. He's able to accept those shots and keep coming forward. That's what we're seeing right now. Three knockout defeats, but looking strong here. You see with it right to the body. Nice little check hook over the top by Musa. Musa's starting to get a little wide with his shots, though. Nice clean right hand. Really sharp there from Musa, but Karahanian looking to respond here. Left there from Musa, but neither really so far making a dent in the other. You mentioned that one punch power, but they're both super tough. Exactly. And this is where I would tell you that Georgie has an advantage in this fight. If he can get the fight to the ground, he is a slick ground technician. He's much more comfortable on the ground. Kane Moose is going to have to work much harder to stop what Georgie does. But right now, did a great job of moving his hips out, keeping the fight right where he wanted it. He did really well there, Kane Moose. A good kick there from Karahanian. Blocked, I think, though, from Moose. It was blind side of us that. Something right to the body again from Musa, just under the armpit there of Karahanian. Oh, hooks from Musa there, potentially winning him this opening round. Landed the better shots, Musa. been uh, just what we hoped for, just what we expected here. That was a beautiful dig to the body and a nice kick by Karahanian to end the round. Explosive finish to the round from Karahanian. Be interesting to see what happens tactically going forward here. Both blowing a bit here as well. It was uh, high energy stuff that it was a really high pace. One of the things, both guys were really putting a lot onto their shots. They were really loading up. They need to relax a little bit, just let things come. But big left hand right there by Kane Musa. Georgia Garhani just walking through it, but it landed clean. And that's the kind of combination that I think in the end created the winning of the round by Kane Musa. It was close. Nice kick at the end by Georgie Karhanian. Both guys getting good shots in. We'll see who can take this next round. Well, Kane Musa said he was going right, to go, round two, work round. to Quick expose the, the chin, the striking, and the strength of Karahanian. He's landed on the chin a few times with power shots, but he hasn't exposed anything so far. Again, though, that jab right at the start of this second round. He looks confident here, Musa. Yeah, but that was a nice right hand by Karahan that just landed. That got K. Musa's attention. Looks for that punch again there, Karahanian. Six of Kane Moose's last eight fights have gone the distance. Four of those have been splits. One, two, and lost two of those, but so many fights going to splits does tell you something about a fighter. One of the things that we were talking about in the first round, that Musa was using combinations. He was throwing more than just one. One, two, threes. Now he's going towards almost just the ones. That's not going to bode well for him against Georgie. He needs to get back to those combinations. That was a nice left hook, though. Really well timed, wasn't it? Landed perfect. He looks to throw it again. That buzz Karahanian. No doubt. And a right hand from Musa, followed by the left hook. Just going through the gears a little bit here, Musa. Footwork there from Karahanian, but. 
Those uh, punches he landed would have given Musa plenty of confidence. Little uppercut on the inside as well there. Still neither really able to put a dent in the other. Karhanya had a little success with that teeth to the body. He should go back with that anytime he's at range. That's a nice little jab to the body that's going to take the air away from Musa. Get off the shorts. Get off the shorts. Let's go. I told him. I told him. Break. Let's go. Five. Both guys confused right there. <laughs> Certainly slowing up. There's that knee from Karahanya, and that was a good idea. You can take a look at those strike stats right now. 42 of 140 for 30 percent. Take a look at the accuracy compared with Musa. 63 of less action in 122, but a much higher landing percentage. This is where Musa often lacks the fight up against that cage. So just putting weight down, a little bit of a hip ride. Trying to land those strikes. We've got a cut on Karahanyan. Yeah, there's blood to that left eye of Karahanyan. Musa grinding that head into Karahanyan as well. And then landing a good right hand. Talked about the combinations and not just going after the one, it was a three punch combination that led to that left hook. Karahanian is in desperate trouble here. What's the back the hook? Trying to get to the cage. How much does he have left? There's still over a minute left in this second round. Referee's having a good look at this. That was a big shot landed by Kane Musa. He's obviously landed a lot since that time, but Karhani's done a good job of just staying in the fight. A little bit of movement, not taking another big one. Remarkable durability there. Survival instinct of Karahanya, but he's still not out of trouble here. Musa just needs to keep his wits here. Karahanya does so well to get back to his feet. If he's still rocked, Musa still has time, and that's a bad cut on the left eye as well. It's an overwhelming K Musa round this one. The real question is how much gas did King Musa lose in trying to finish the fight? He's a little gassed right now. Well, Karahanyan's done remarkably well to survive there. Stop, stop. Easier. Easier. Great round for Kane Musa. Beautiful combination to drop him down. Nice, beautiful shot to the body. Look at that left hook up high. That's what we're talking about. You're getting a guy. All of a sudden, he's getting hit to the body. His hands start to drop down. Here comes the left hook over the top. It drops him. Boom, that was a sweet left hook by Kane Musa. And then he just was all over Georgie Karahanian. Georgie did an amazing job to survive. Look at how stiff his legs are there as he gets rocked. He was able to at least collect himself. A lot of ground and pound coming from Kane Musa here. Georgie turning so he can try to slow that progression down, take away the posture of Kane Musa. He survived the round, though. They've had a job to do on that cut as well. It's a nasty one on the left eyelid there for Karahanian. How much gas room. did it take out of Musa, though? Thing is, it will have taken right, plenty out of Karahanian. That's three, evident. Great job. Let's go. How are you scoring this one at the moment? Round two was an easy one, John. What about that first? Well, honestly, I, I go 10-9. I had Kane Musa in the first, and I give him a 10-8 in that second because, look, he dominated Karhanian 
for a major point in part of that round. Karahanyan needs a massive third round here. Does he have it in him? We know all about the, the durability and the spirit of this man. This has gone excellently so far for Musa. This is smart fighting by Georgie Carhania to try to get this fight to the ground. You saw Camus is starting to talk to him a little bit. Don't, don't get in that position where you're not thinking that Georgie Carhania is not still dangerous. He is definitely still dangerous. And he knows that, I wouldn't say the ground's his only way, but it's certainly his best way. at the moment defending this position he's trying to get his arms around that single leg nice job by Kane Musa to stay on his feet with that Musa uses his feet well and spins out of that position Sixth for most fights in Bellator. Georgie Karahanya, this fight number 21. Great head position by Musa. Musa, a training partner of Saul Rogers, so he knows all about beating Karahanya. He talked a lot about that in the build up. Karahanya needs something special, something explosive. We know he's capable of it. And there's that left hook again from Musa. Some great movement here, Musa, and real good shot selection too. The accuracy has been outstanding. When you're doing that kind of work and you're landing, don't crush the space. Don't come into him. You're the one that's doing the damage. Step back, give yourself the space, and then come back at him again. Right now, when they separate, Kane Moose is the dangerous fighter. He's the one that's doing damage against Karhanya. There's a tiny reach advantage, Musa, but at times it's felt like it's much wider than that, much bigger than that. He's used the distance so well. Again, Karahanya just goes for that single leg. It's the final two minutes now. Switching, trying to hit that ankle, going back to the single leg. He's trying to run the pipe here. Unable to get the position he needs to be in. And a lot of that is the wrist control that we're seeing from Kane Musa. Now Musa's shown really good calmness under either the pressure of trying to finish or this kind of pressure. And a good thinking fight from him. In a minute now, and Karahanian really needs to make something happen. Yeah, I really like what I saw there, because a lot of times I know Kane Musa would have gone to the elbow strikes to the head, but he would have ended up being taken down, and he stuck with what he needed to do to keep himself on his feet. That was a really nice sequence by Kane Musa. Okay, Moose has worked an awful lot on his footwork and on that sort of sense of control. And I think you can really see it. Georgia Garhanya grabbing the cage, holding that leg in place. Don't grab it, grab on both sides. George is doing everything he can. Yeah, and the MTT guys who are right to our left. Uh, I don't blame him. Telling the referee about that. The their man is turning on the start here towards the end of the fight. Surely Kane Musa's night here. Good straight right hand there. Karahanya throwing, swinging wildly. Well, you feel 
You're never sure, but you feel that Moose has done more than enough there. I believe that Kane Moose has done more than enough to get a win here. That was a very good fight by him. A lot of times we see Kane making mistakes in the fight that end up putting him in bad positions. He was very smart, he was very calculated, and had a lot of power on those shots. I think that got him the win. Of course, we'll find out shortly, but that feels like a big night, a big performance from Kane Musa. As I mentioned at the start, Karahanian requested that fight. He thought he could get the better of Musa, but Musa was always confident. Let's take a look at that third and final round, John. Again, this is what I said. I kind of stunned Georgie again there a little bit. You saw Georgie planting his feet and throwing back. That's one of the things you'll see a fighter do when they get stunned. This is just part of their training. We're just going to throw back. Georgie's showing how tough he is. But Kane Moose is the one that landed the big, heavier shots throughout this fight. Great, great battle between two tough guys. And we'll find out very, very shortly if he's done enough. Yeah, I've been to the trenches, the darkest times, and this is where it matters, where it comes to light. Yeah. Ever. Musa with a message. Karahanian surely knows. Fighters tend to know. Michael C. Williams will be up there shortly with the verdict. Still waiting for him to get into his position in the cage here. Yeah, Michael's there behind the fighters. Oh, the expected fireworks, we certainly had them in. Those opening couple of rounds as Musa started to take over. And was it enough? Let's get now to Michael C. Williams with the verdict. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. Ron McCarthy, David Peabody, Eric Cologne, all have it exactly the same at 30 to 27 for the winner by unanimous decision. Kane, the danger, Musa. Kane Musa does it. Real emotion there on Kane Musa's face. You can see just how much that meant to him. Unanimous decision and one that you certainly couldn't argue with. Moves to 14 and four. Well, Kane Musa takes the plaudits of his team. Go to the trenches. Let's go there because that's where I live and survive. Rude boy. Yeah, Kane Musa is emotional and has plenty to say, and he'll have something to say to Big John now. Let's get up to Big John. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm late getting up here to talk to this man, but he put on one hell of a fight. Kane, you came in here and you were trading blows. The big difference, you were throwing combinations and he was throwing ones. Yeah, I knew, you know, I knew Georgie's fix set. I knew this, this camp was all about speed. So I watched his fights. I knew it was all about speed. It's all about preparation and we prepared perfectly. What we saying, people? Did we just lay it down or what? Yeah, shout out to Drogheda. In the second round, you threw a beautiful combination to the body, a left hook to the head, and put him down. Did you think you had it finished? Yeah, I had pieced that one together nice old dinner. Remember, you told me, you know, these things stick in my mind. You said, Kane, you said, you've got the power. You just got to believe in it. And you know what? Tonight, I believed in myself. Well, you fought a beautiful fight. Congratulations on a great win. Who should you be fighting next? Yo, listen, put me in the rankings. Don't ever disrespect my name again. In the top 10, you already know, you don't see what I did to Georgia. He's an elite fighter, he's got 31 wins, now he's got 14 losses, he's got well more experience.
sense to me. And look, I stepped up. They put the fight in front of me. I said straight away, yeah, I'll take him. I'm a top 10 fighter. Put me in them rankings. Put some respect on my name. I will definitely put respect on your name. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Kay Musa. That is what this sport is all about. His redemption song continues. And boy, is he singing loud. And boy, did he enjoy being here. Irish blood in his veins. And that was a terrific display. Great aggression, consistency. Picked his shots well. Showed calmness in there too, under all kinds of pressure. But Musa, absolutely dominant. Time for us to head to Aiden Power. Thank you, thank you very much, Dave. You know, often when you see these fights on paper, you go, could be good, could be good. When we saw Bellator 285 prelims and main card on paper, we thought, there we say it, this could be the best card ever in Dublin. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but so far it is working out that way. Great performance from Kane Musa. He was shouting out his Irish heritage. We can trace back to County Drogheda, to his grandmother. Well, another fighter who comes from County, uh, comes from Drogheda in indeed County Loud. I should know whether there's a county or a town. I'm from Ireland is Kieran Clark. He will open up our main card tonight. The SPG fighter is a real fan favorite and he's taken on Rafael Utsen at a contracted weight of 150 pounds. And for Clark, the 27 year old, he'll make the walk for the sixth time in his young professional career. And so far, so perfect with five victories. Three of those coming inside the distance. Tonight, he faces Brazil's Rafael Utsen, who's a Muay Thai world champion. He's making his Bellator debut. He's also got five wins on his record. All of those have come by knockout and indeed submission. And he says despite the late call-up, he has been training for this fight, not for a week, not for 10 days, but indeed for all his life. This is his big opportunity, and he is here looking for the knockout. I'm going to bring in Big John McCarthy to talk more about Kieran Clark and his brilliant rise so far in Bellator. John, what is it that impresses you so far about Kieran Clark? You know, there's so much that impresses me about Kieran Clark, and the thing that is, most people don't realize he had a huge amateur career where he had losses and he learned from those losses and since he's come into the professional ranks he does not make the mistakes of a young fighter he is absolutely dangerous on the ground and if he gets you to the ground take a look at that choke it's a rear naked choke but he never tries to lock it in the normal lock position he always goes palm to palm because he knows he has the squeeze to put you unconscious this kid's ground game is devastating. His stand-up is getting better and better, and he's using it now to get himself into positions to take that fight to the ground. This kid is gonna be something special. Just look out. Well, thanks to Aiden and John. Now the local fighter that's causing a great deal of buzz is Dara Kelly. He takes on Kai Stevens, who surely has his hands full against the man they call the Moville Mauler. And now ready to make his way to the cage, Kai Kidyehi Stevens. Well, another Bellator debutant in our prelims here in the shape of Kai Stevens from Portsmouth on England's south coast, who describes himself as a workhorse with a dream, one that he's living just by being a fighter. Three wins in four professional outings so far after a good amateur career, but he has his hands full tonight. One of the toughest assignations in any fighter tonight for Stevens. Oh, my God, he has got a tough one coming in here. It's, you know, it's the matter of he just needs to fight his fight. Don't try to come out here and impress anyone. Be smart, use your leg, frustrate Dara Kelly as much as possible, and drag that fight into the other rounds. That's how you get your win. And now we welcome to the camp. All the way from County Donegal, the Mobile Mauler heads to the professional cage and the Bellator cage for a second time. And back in February, that first outing went just about as well as it could with that swarming submission win against a decent fighter as well in Junior Morgan. There's a lot of excitement around about this guy, John. All the talk 
seems to be about him, doesn't it? Yeah, he's got the perfect <laughs> nickname in the Mulville Mauler because he mauls his opponents. You watch him, and he's just all over him, and he's strong. He just grabs a hold of whatever he wants and then makes the submission happen. I watch him do it with Kimuras. I watch him do it with arm bars. Here he goes with the guillotine. Look at the pressure that he creates. Man, this guy is very, very strong, very explosive, and he doesn't believe anybody can beat him. The tail of the tape as Dara Kelly and Kai Stevens get it on at lightweight. Kelly's already making noise right at the start of his pro career, John. Right here, I got it, both 24 years of age. Both guys are so young in the sport. It's showing with a 1-0, 3-1 record. This is the future. It is the future. The present is Michael C. Williams. Welcome and a good evening to all those joining us tonight live on BBC iPlayer as we go now here at Bellator 285 to three five minute rounds in the lightweight division introducing the blue corner at six foot weighing in 155.2 pounds his professional record three wins one loss. Across the cage, his adversary tonight fights out of the red corner at six foot weight in the same 155.2 pounds as a professional. He stands at one and oh by way of Mobile. He fights out of Dublin, Ireland, presenting Dara the Mobile Mother Kelly. And the referee in charge, Kerry Hatley. This is such an educated crowd. They know this sport. They know how special Dara Kelly is. Did you hear the roar for him? Goodness me. One pro fight <laughs> under his belt. And, and he gets that ready, kind ready, of roar. Could you imagine if he fights for a title here? Here he comes. The Mogul Mauler. Up against Kid Yeti Kai Stevens. See, that's exactly what Kai Stevens did not need to have happen. You needed to use lateral movement to stay on that outside and move around. Don't let Kelly get you to the ground right away. This is exactly what case, Kelly likes. And again, starting to maul his opponent. Maul his opponent and getting into a dangerous position already here. Kelly is not messing about here. Nice job by Stevens to work his way back to his feet. But right there, that is so... It's so difficult in your mind once you work all that way back up and he takes you right back down. Comes out like a runaway train, Dara Kelly. Good from Stevens though. This is where he's trying to hang on here. You know, it's, it's, a, it's good work by Stevens. And you're seeing Dara Kelly right there when he's trying to do that big lift. You're burning a lot of energy for no reason. Slow it down. Grab the legs, pull them out, step over just like he is to control those legs. Now that's a nice move by Dara Kelly. Stevens again working to get himself back to his feet. Well, this works straight back up, straight back up. There we go. Stevens said his greatest strength in the cage is his boxing, so he's not in the position he wants to be in at all. Well, he's absolutely right. That is it. That's his, you know, greatest strength is his hands. But it's hard to use your hands when someone's on your back. Kelly has that sense of not being denied about him, just a relentlessness about him. Just wants to bring that pressure and see if his opponent can live with him and see if he can cope. It's so disheartening when you work so hard to get yourself back to your feet. You get there and the guy just returns you to the mat that fast. A lot of energy being put out by both guys. But Kai Stevens is working very hard to get himself back to his feet right now. As you see his leg trapped. That figure four by Kelly. And Kelly's clever too, isn't he, with those sneaky shots, those little hooks. Good. Let's work up now, Kai. Work up. Work up. There we 
Stevens corner. Brennan Adams telling him to work up to get back to his feet as Kelly just going to take him down again. Again, until you talk about something that just takes all the steam and air out of you. It's disheartening when you work that hard to get up and all of a sudden he drags you right back down into the same position. Looking to put that right arm under pressure there, Kelly. And that's what happens when you, he goes for that underhook, he leaves his neck exposed, Dar Kelly jumps right on it. Good Yeti though, driving Kelly back. Great job by Stevens. I would suggest separate. Don't play his game. This is where Kelly wants to be. He can grapple all day long. Where he's not super comfortable is in the stand-up, and that's where he's going to expend more energy. There was definitely a bit of machismo about that from Stevens, having got to his feet and tried himself to effect the takedown. The way that Kelly came out, Beautiful job of Kelly. You, you notice how he bounced him off of the cage. That's Don't just a guy that's been in there the grappling in that cage, understands the things that he can do. Beautiful tie up of the legs here with the figure four. We would have hoped to have Stevens out of there by now. He came out looking for something early, looking to get this crowd going, but it's impressive from Stevens. And now, he gets back to where he wants to be with 45 seconds of the opening round remaining. Can he do any damage now on the feet here, Kid Yeti? Right hand from him. Well, this is what I was talking about. I thought that Kai Stevens needed to get this into the second and then third round. Get him tired. Make him work hard in the stand-up. It's really Stevens that's worked hard off the ground, but he looks like he's not any worse for the wear. He's got a lot of energy. He's so strong, Kelly. Close the gap again there. And right hand, no, that oh, buzzed Kelly. That did buzz him. Caught him by the left ear. Looking for the uppercut. A short hook as well there from Stevens. That will give him a little bit of hope. Stop. He's not read the script, kid yet. <laughs> Here's the calming words of John Cabinet. You're looking at the takedowns of Dark Kelly. Did a great job of consistently returning Kai Stevens to the mat. Different types of takedowns. Here he drags him over. Good positioning. All of these just over and over making Kai Stevens work super hard to get back to his feet. But when he did, take a look at the shot he lands right here, right off the top of the head right there, just above the ear. You can see. Off balance now, a little bit stunned. Not the finishing shot that he was needed, but he definitely got Dara Kelly's attention. There you go. And Kelly's talking to him, telling him that he didn't hurt him. That's normally a surefire sign that he did. <laughs> Here we go, round exactly two, man, it. ready. Let's go work. One of the golden rules, that. <laughs> Steven's problem is he needs to keep it on the feet here, and of course, Kelly wants this on the floor. And if Kai Stevens can get some separation, look, Dara Kelly gives him a lot of opportunities to land the strikes. His hands are you know, down low. He's looping his shot to get in on the takedown. So he just needs to work towards getting the separation and then straight shots down the middle. They're going to get on target. Good adjustment there from Kelly. Stevens, a training partner of Alex Bunder. We've already seen that. Lose to Kenny Mokonwana in these uh, prelims. Another Adams v. Kavanaugh clash. Well, there's a reason that Kai Stevens is 3-1. and one. He can fight. You're seeing it by everything that he's been stopping. But now this is not good with where he's at. The cage is going to give Dara Kelly some problems because he's got an arm triangle set up. Can't hold on to it. That debut win against Junior Morgan, where he was so dominant, was by a guillotine. Well, he's got a gift wrap. If you look at the right arm, he's gift wrapped the right, the left arm of Kai Stevens. So it's a matter of now in mount, 
He's holding on to that arm. We'll see what he decides to go to. As for those elbows, but that's the try. Got a better position here. Good job of wriggling out of that position. Great job by Stevens pushing on the hips, but both hands on the hips. He's given the opportunity for Dara Kelly to land shots, but he was no, he knows I've got to get out of this. Puts both hands on the hips, pushes him off and away. Now he's in on the legs of Dara Kelly. Does what I got, he it, I got it. Trying to do in that opening round, Stevens. Okay, stop right there. Stop right there. Time. Time. Come here. Well, that might be a little bit of luck there for Stevens. I don't know if that's that left Stevens. Up. Got a I little got bit time. of uh, equipment a failure problem. on Dara Kelly's left hand. Tape, yeah, equipment failure is the phrase, all right. Hey, so the glove spot. I need tape. Tape. Yeah, the problem with the tape. Hey, right there. Frustrating, isn't it, for Kelly and the crowd are frustrated as well. And there's got to be a quicker way than this of fixing it. Sometimes there's just no way of doing something fast. There's the scissors. There's a roller tape somewhere as well. Here's a red tape. Come here, right here. Well, stay right there. Well, this is giving. Finally both, got the tape. And this is giving both guys a long break. But I honestly would have thought Kai Stevens was the guy that was pushing the pace a little bit. Dark Kelly had used a lot of energy. This is probably helping him more than it is Kai Stevens. Finally, they got the tape. Keep it low. Keep it low. get the job done to make sure that there are no sharp edges on that. OK, come here. I don't know things about this sport. Where does it go next? You were on this well, there's an argument you were on about the position. Right well, there. he did not have Ready? his hands clapped, so go. he grabbed his hands, which is him trying to cheat, which I don't blame him, but you got to put him back with where, what he had. So both fighters a little refreshed after that slightly surreal interlude. Uh, this time, has he got it? He's in trouble that Kai Stevens needs to continue to move. That Dar's choke is on. Well, he looked to have that Dar's choke tight. Stevens trying to extricate himself. Nice job by Stevens. Brings himself out. <laughs> yeah, he can land shots here on Kelly. What's those? Good job, this from Kai Stevens. He's better than the workhorse he described himself as. Six and one as an amateur. Clearly a great level of skill. You know, he's getting high here. What you get the sweep by Dark Kelly. He's got that leg entwined. If you notice, he's moving that leg over. He's going to come up on top. Kai Stevens needs to push back. There you go, try to push back with the arms, get to it. We're in a splatal position. Just come up on top, nice move by Don Kelly. He's looking at a splatal, but that's not going to end up, if, if Stevens has any flexibility, it's not going to end up working, so just come up on top and get busy from there. Stevens doing a good job there of defending that position. Not having it all his own way here. But you're right, that little break, I think, freshened up Kelly Stevens is looking a little tired here, a little beleaguered. Increasingly desperate, maybe. Oh, 
goals from Kelly. You get a reaction from the crowd. Easy on, easy on, easy on. Not too many people saw this going into round three. Stevens deserves great credit for that. This is what I was talking about. This is the fight that I thought Kai Stevens needed to fight as far as dragging it into the later rounds to get that win. He's got a great gas tank. And he's good with his hands. He's much better, I've seen to death tonight, than I've ever seen him before on the ground. He's done a great job of nullifying everything that Dara Kelly has tried. Well, Dublin fans, we know you love your MMA, and Bellator is going to be coming back to the three arena on February the 24th. Tickets go on sale next week. Make your plans now. Come and enjoy the atmosphere here. I promise you it's not bad. It's a lot better than not bad. More, it's buzzing in here, here tonight, and it's only going to get louder and more passionate, and they want to cheer this fella on to a win. They wanted an early win for Dara oh, Kelly, but Kid Yeti Come on. from Portsmouth, Kai Stevens, doing a good job here. Kelly needs these kind of tough opponents. If he's going to progress anyway, still got to win the fight, though. started this fight off if you recall going after Stevens mauling and being all over him but unable to finish any of the techniques that he was trying to apply Stevens just hung tough this entire time and now entering this third round looks like he's the fresher fighter to me this is where Stevens wants it Kelly again shakes his head certainly been a test to the Kelly gas tank just not able to stay in that stand up <laughs> create that distance for long enough <laughs> so Steven looking for that Camaro grip to try to peel Kelly off of him can't control it Kelly working hard to get his hands clasped together on those legs. Once he gets it, right hits the ground. Exactly where Kelly wants it again. Is the Mobile Mauler just going to grind his way to a point win here? They hope for fireworks on the ground. They hope to have a submission to cheer. Dara Kelly with a very tight leg lace, controlling the lower legs. Of Kai Stevens there. Every time Kai Stevens gets his legs free, he's able to get himself back to his feet. Not an easy thing to do with a lot of weight from Dara Kelly being Dara Kelly being placed down on him. Stevens is looking towards a Kimura on the right arm of Dara Kelly. Dara Kelly's starting to turn that around on him. His arms at placed. Doesn't really have a grip on it, so he's going to be able to slide it out free. Goes back to the gift wrap on that right arm. Well, Kelly's dominated on the ground. He said that Stevens had a weak ground grain, but he thought he was going to get him out of there quickly. There'll be a lot to learn from this fight, but Kelly's starting to unload now. Kelly getting a little high, it needs to suck his hips back. Nice job of pulling the legs out. Apart from that one shot that Steve has landed, all of the offensive weapons have been with Dara Kelly. Oh, good work, Stevens has done, has been defensive, but that defense just breached there. Trying to work himself, build a base, get back up, and then we'll do it. Still mounted. 
every time it looks as if Kelly's going to take over, Stevens finds a way to survive. That's been the theme so far. Nice job of shrimping out, moving those legs. Getting Darko off of that mount. To the final minute of the fight now. Position enough where we had just enough space where the choke's not working. I heard that Dublin Raw build as the choke seemed to be in and seemed to be tied. Final seconds. Stevens survives. Comfortable win for Dara Kelly, but there's a lot to work on there, John. It's a great learning fight for him. And well, Kai Stevens, hats off. Round of applause for that defensive effort. Yeah, absolutely. He went in there with you know, all the intention of winning this fight, dragging it into the later rounds, and just beating Dar Kelly, but unable to stop the takedowns. That was the big difference. When you're looking at all of those takedowns, man, 11 takedowns overall in the fight. Yeah, we'll wait Great experience. for the decision oh, here. Call. It'll be comfortable for Kelly. It's over. It's over. You're over. Now, here you go. Also, place the top. Next opponent's watching this. Rip, rip, rip. You're covered on it. Five more rounds. Five more rounds. There you go. We can get that decision now. Let's get to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first, Brian Miner, scores the fight 30 to 27. Well, judges Eric Colon and Kevin McDonald both see the fight the same. 30 26. All have it for the winner by unanimous decision. Dara, the movie. They love him here, and he got what he wanted in terms of a win, but maybe not performance. We can hear from him now. He's with John. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with Dara Kelly. Dara, that was a tough, grueling fight, but you were in complete control throughout most of it with your grappling. What was it like for you to get the minutes in this cage like that and go three rounds hard with someone that would not quit? Yeah, like, I'm, I'm disappointed with myself. Um, it's my first decision. Uh, I'll blame the antibiotics for the cardio. I'm um, sorry for that day. I want, I want to come out in the next performance and uh, I'll, put, I'll put on a better show. Um, pro props to my opponent. He was, he was tougher than I expected now. But look, it's 15 minutes in the bank for me. That's what I needed. Never went the distance before. And you know what? I had a lot of lessons learned and I still got the W. So. Uh, I'll be back better than ever. That's a learning curve for me. 
I agree. I think that that is the type of fight you as a young fighter need because those minutes are important and you learn a lot from what was going on in here and you fix the little mistakes. Who is it that you would like to face in this cage next, though? Uh, I would like another tough test like that. Um, I, don't, I don't have no names. I should have a name, but after that, I'm, I'm very disappointed in myself. And I'll be back better than ever, whoever it is, and I'll fix the issues. And I'll be back to my finishing ways next. Well, you have nothing to be disappointed in. You put on a great performance. Congratulations on an outstanding win. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the Mobile Mall. He gets the win, and that ultimately is what matters. Time now to move from the Mobile Mauler to the Darling of Dublin. It's Aiden Power. You are a man of few but good words, I should say, my friend Dave Farrah. Thank you very much. We are bubbling in Dublin, and we're going to talk about the second fight in our main card this evening and look at our stacked featherweight division because the landscape at the top could look very different in seven days' time, and it starts tonight with Mads Brunel and Pedro Carvalho. Both Brunel, who's ranked at number three, and Carvalho, who's ranked at number five, are looking to bounce back from recent defeat. So it is the get-back and also a huge opportunity to advance to title contention. Denmark's Mads Brunel was on a seven-fight win streak. That included victories over Emmanuel Sanchez and Saul Rogers. And with nine of his 16 wins coming by submission, the BJJ Black Belt firmly believes he holds all the aces tonight against Pedro. He says, my hands, my grappling pressure will be nothing like he's ever before felt before. I am going to make him question his manhood. Well, we know Pedro Carvalho has been tested in that regard and indeed in that department before. He has wins over Derek Campos and Sam Cecilia. And of course, a signature win inside this cage, inside this arena against Daniel Vichel. And coming into this one, Pedro is as confident as he was before that Daniel Vichel fight. And when we ask him why, he said it's because not just physical improvements he's made in camp, but mental ones too. He is so confident that he will win tonight. He's going to put on a fight of the night performance. And if that's not confidence, I don't know what you call it. We are really looking forward to it. Our main card kicks off live in noisy Dublin at 4 o'clock Eastern turn on showtime now the prelims continue dave thanks very much indeed aiden and that noise is starting to build you can sense it here i'm sure you can hear it at home now jordan winsky and brett johns become the center of attention now at phantom weight both look to build on good wins last time out now set to make his way to the cage, Jordan, I'm gonna Winski. Well, Jordan Winski, who goes, it must be said by the pressure-building nickname of I'm gonna Winski, lost on his Bellator debut against Brian Moore, but then at Bellator 279 in Hawaii is a late replacement. He grabbed a victory by unanimous decision against Ryan De La Cruz, and once again here in Dublin, he comes in at relatively short notice to try and upset the bantamweight applicant. He says he likes being a late-notice opponent. Well, he's getting his wish, John. He is getting his wish. I don't know if I'd like it, but... He's done well, and he's a well-rounded fighter. He likes to stand up, good on the ground, and he just keeps coming after his opponent. A very durable fighter, a guy that never stops looking for that win. He never believes that there's a moment that he can't end up with the finish, and that makes him a guy that's very tough to be in this cage with. Now making his way, Brad Johns. So this grinding wrestler, Brett Johns, was supposed to provide a stern, stern test for James Gallagher here. Oh, was it the other way around? But with that fight put to one side for now, he's up against this late replacement. He mustn't make any mistakes. He looks to build on that really good win last time against Kershev Kakarov, having lost on Bellator debut. That was some way to respond. And he's a fighter that many people see as making a really, really big noise going forward. I've heard him described in a lot of places as a real fighter's fighter, John. He is a fight exactly with what we talk about. It's a guy, man. Brett Johns is a guy who will not back down. His grappling is outstanding. He's not the guy that is overly, you know, exciting as far as does the spinning attacks or anything like that. 
But if you want to talk about effectiveness, and that's what wins MMA matches, Brett Johns is effective. Look at him get the position, three-quarter mount, then he takes full mount, back mount, just pushes the legs out. Little shots here, but eventually he starts doing bigger ones. And man, he is, when he gets into position on top of you, he can't get him off. He's like Velcro. That's what makes Brett Johns so difficult in the game. The tail of the tape between the bantamweights, Brett Johns and Jordan Winsky. And John, you picked out that difference in height. Well, there's not a big difference in reach. It's the same reach, but the difference in height, that 5'7 to 5'9, Jordan Winsky wants to keep this fight at range. He doesn't want to be in a grappling exchange for most of the fight with Brett Johns, so use that height and keep him away. Is he going to win ski? Is he going to lose ski? <laughs> Let's get to Michael C. Williams. And now tonight here in Dublin, the prelims roll on here at Bellator 285 as we go now to three five-minute rounds <laughs> in the bantamweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 135 pounds even. His professional record, 12 wins, three defeats from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, USA. Jordan Arm Gunho wins And across the cage is adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot seven, weighing in 135.7 pounds as a professional. 18 victories, three losses from Swansea Wales presenting Brett. in charge Kevin McDonald Brett Johns is fired up here and ready I think to make a statement it's two great characters these two when you talk to them when you hear them talk now they go head to head ready to fight ready Winsky to fight? says he's Let's mean go. and he's going to break Johns and John says good luck with that Brett, John, uh, Brett Johns. And, uh, Brett Johns. Brett Sorry, John. John. No problem. His debut fight against Danny Sabatello tells you you're not going to break Brett Johns. Danny Sabatello came in out wrestling, put on a great performance. In no way was there ever a moment you thought Brett Johns was broken in that fight. That's just not part of who he is. It's a good shot, right hand there from Brett Johns, who looks for that takedown. Didn't really earn the right, though. Nice, dirty boxing by Jordan Winsky. Pushing him to the cage here. One thing Winsky did say about Brett Jones is he said, I've watched him a lot. And he does the same thing in every fight. He does it very well, but I know what to expect. It's not the man that knows the, the 10,000 kicks. It's the man that's practiced one kick 10,000 times you got to worry about. You've got to do a book on the philosophy of MMA at some point. I'm telling you, <laughs> it'd sell well. Winsky doing a, a really good job right here. Displaying his legs, keeping. Look at how he's keeping the arm of Johns up just by the trapping of it right there. That's making it to where Johns having a hard time dropping levels into his legs. We'll see if he can continue this position. Red Johns driving forward, just inching his arms and his hands closer together, looking for that takedown. Nice job of movement. When you see that movement, you see Winsky's legs come together. That's what allows Johns to get his hands together. Exactly where Johns wants to be now. Already moved up the levels once after winning his first 15 and then just finding that next level a bit too good, but. Now he's starting to build here with Bellator. He said he wants to send a message, Johns, to one specific individual, and then he wants to be part of the Jimmy show. <laughs> well, he was supposed to be fighting James Gallagher here tonight. James. Got an injury, was had to pull out of the, the match. Hopefully someday in the future we're going to see that. 
In fact, Brett went even further and said he wants the Jimmy show in Wales. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> nice elbows. Solid strikes by Brett Johnson. And these just add up. This is what is effective ground and pound. He's landing good, clean shots. Nothing that is devastating right now, but they just tend to build up and start to deplete the energy and resources of the fighter that's on the bottom. He's got so much confidence as well in his cardio, Brett Johns. Never feels that tank is going to empty. Gives him great confidence. Allows him to affect this sort of grinding style and break down his opponent bit by bit. Let's be looking to turn that, change the angle on it, look for the arm bar, nothing there. sure that he's doing enough work here just to keep the judge's attention well, we talked about progression just switched from full guard to half guard so he's improving his position he's doing damage he's being effective this is you know, all types of different forms of fighting in mma and you've got to respect each and every form there is Jones is really effective and it does have a cumulative effect as well. You can see he's already swelling under that left eye of Jordan Winsky. Now take a look at the face around the eyes of Jordan Winsky and you can see that the swelling is starting. He's taken quite a few shots. Sneaky effective fighters like Brett Johns. They don't seem to be that active, but we start to bust you up pretty quickly. And here he goes, Johns. Moment, he's doing a job here on Jordan Winsky. Stop! Clean break. Uh, Winsky being told there to take big deep breaths, and I'm not surprised. A bit unsteady there as he headed out of uh, round one. Uh, in his corner is smiling Sam Alvey. The uh, guy's had a great fight career. Outstanding person, just a wonderful human being. Always brought his wife to every fight and had her in his corner for every fight. He's, he's the uh, consummate family man. He needs words of inspiration here, though, John. If he's passing, let it pass. I don't care if he's in the Looks unruffled. Looks like it's the start of round one, Brett Jones. Bouncing up and down. Well, it is as far as damage for him because he didn't get hit with much. <laughs> round two. So we start of round two. Brett Jones, the Welshman, big fan of Swansea City Football Club. That's soccer to you. <laughs> and the Welsh national team who qualified for the World Cup for the first time in 64 years. Very proud nation at the moment. And an MMA fighter to be proud of here. A jab from Winsky and a right hand from Winsky to back it up and another oh. short right hand. Now that did get Brett Jones attention. Yeah, two solid right hands by Jordan Winsky. Hey, I Winsky does have that height advantage and that range as well. Jones though getting into range and throwing himself.
Bob has got his hands clasped together. Nice job by Winsky trying to fight that off, but when he gets under those, that hip area and able to get underneath onto the legs, very difficult to stop because they can elevate where your toes are not touching the ground. There's no friction, and all of a sudden you're hitting the ground. And now once again, John, that grinding starts. John's getting into that position and doing really good work again. Well, we heard in the corner from Sam Alvey, he was talking to his fighters saying, look, I don't, I don't care if he passes, you've got to get back to your feet. And so we're going to see if Jordan Whiskey takes that advice from his corner and gives position here in trying to get himself back up. Right now, Brett John's going to be passing. It's a beautiful knee slice. Going to be going right to the mount. And we're about to find out. doing a good job of using the cage at that point. He turned himself to the cage so he could push off of it. That kept Brett Johns from being able to stay in mount. John's making sure though he landed those hammer fists and sharp elbow as well. Moving away here at Winsky, making really good use of that position. I know it's something you often talk about, John, just in terms of winning rounds, make sure you keep working. Johns is really good at that. You're making it very easy for the judges right now if you're Brett Johns. You're keeping a guy on his back. You're the one that's landing all the shots, and you're keeping his offense basically to zero. Oh. Not hard for a judge to figure out who's winning. Oh. So you to convert it like he did against Kakarov. Nice pass. To a stoppage win. Good pass oh. by Brett Johns. Right into half guard now. Jones would like to get this closer to the center of the cage. He's happy to do his work here. Competing in motorsport, <laughs> Brett Johns trying to have an amateur career in rally cross and rallying, and the foot's going down on the gas here towards the end of round number two. Becoming more difficult for Jordan Winsky to be able to control the posture of Brett Johns, and that's why you're seeing him being able to open up with heavier shots. <laughs> so Winsky said. Johns does the same thing in every fight, but right now it's working. It's one thing knowing, it's another thing being able to do something about it. Absolutely. When you're, when you're good at what you do, and you can force it on your opponent, that's why you have a record of 18-3 and three like Brett Johns. Stop. Clean break, guys. Johns are back now with Sam Alvey. as clearly as we did pressure 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 I think that's what he's been doing <laughs> it wasn't news to him yeah no. you're right third and final so third and final round here 
Brett Jones in that southpaw stance against Jordan Winsky, based now in Murfreesboro in Tennessee. It's a late replacement as well. We need to put that into context. It's not like Rafael Lutzen in the, the main card. He's had a while to prepare for this Winsky. And this is what that added height does if you're Winsky, is it makes it more difficult for someone to drag you to ground in that position, but eventually Brett Johns gets it there. And more of the same from Brett Johns. Is it that, this kind of moment against Kakarov where Johns just became too much? Yes, it is, and this is what this is what that ground and pound does. It, it, it's not going to stop a lot of guys in that first or second round, but it just ends up depleting them of energy they get beat down their durability starts to give way and it becomes just overwhelming for him and so Brett Johns he's doing exactly what he does and he's doing it well and you got to be very impressed with how effective he is with his grappling and his ground and pound striking. Does a nice job. Look at that. Switches from punch to elbow, back to punch. So move that position so he can land more effectively here, Johns. Just wonder if he's starting to sense that Winsky might be weakening. Pass the leg. Very nicely. It looked like he was going to go kiss the time. He decided, you know what, I'm going straight back. Now he's just in that position, head down head, but he's in a very good position to deliver heavy strikes now. Winsky working himself up to his feet. Nothing at the moment that Winsky can do here about the pressure of Brett Johns. And this is where it saps the energy of Winsky. Brett Johns always mentions when he talks to us that he's got a dog called Giuseppe Giovanni. And whenever I say it, I always think of the dog sitting in front of the television at home, cheering him on. Maybe now he's getting excited. Great job of controlling that ankle, pulling the leg away. Brett, Brett Johns is just in complete control of this fight. This is where he started to grind Kakarov down with shots like this. Beautiful pass in the side. Almost has his back if he wants to put the hook in now. There you go. Now he's in that same position he went with. Kakarov as you're talking about. Linsky just managed to extricate himself, but he's not been able to do any damage here to Brett Johns. He's been trying to escape. There's just no way out for him. Nice slashing elbow by Brett Johns. Goes back to the hammer fist punch. Just doing whatever he wants. Doing whatever he wants and doing his job very, very effectively. It is, and this is where, again, you're going to get a lot of people, I don't like to see that. That's not the kind of fight I want to see. This is effective fighting. This is MMA. It's one of the elements of MMA. A lot of people want to see those spinning attacks and those big knockouts. I understand that, but this is just as effective. What do we say at the start? He's a fighter's fighter. 
And this has been that kind of performance that other fighters will really admire. He hasn't got him out of there. But he's done more than enough, Brett Johns. Straight away, he's in Winsky's ear. <laughs> we'll wait and see by how much he gets it. Not an if he gets it, though. really that Winsky could do and there's that Welsh dragon be interesting to see what is next for Brett Johns because I've always said he is going to take some beating in this kind of form Michael is making his way into position here. All smiles in there. Let's get up now to Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first, Ben Cartlett, scores the fight. 30-27. Well, judges Eric Cologne and Brian Miner both see it the same. 30 to 26. All for the winner by unanimous decision. Brett. The pride of Swansea does it and moves to 19 and 3. Hats off to Brett Johns. Let's take a look now, though, at our co main event tonight the light heavyweights, John. It's hard to exaggerate how much people are looking forward to this. Yoel Romero and Melvin Manhoff. The numbers get people excited. We're going to take a look at some highlights of both of them as well in a moment. But 29 knockouts for Melvin Manhoff, 12 from Yoel Romero. Doesn't really tell the story of just how good they both are. But they're both so, so explosive and have that serious knockout power. Oh, my God. Both of them, when, when they decide to throw, it's just an explosive moment. You look at Yoel Romero. He's made out of something different than all the rest of us. So strong, so explosive. Even at his age, he's not slowing down at all. And his power is just immense here at finishing off Alex Polizzi. This guy is remarkable. And then you take a look at his opponent. Look at that left hook by Melvin Manhoff. Every time I've watched Melvin Manhoff fight, and I used to go to Japan to watch him at times, this guy goes to finish fights. Yes, he has 15 losses, but in those 15 losses, and I will tell you, it's true, he was only losing one of those fights. He was beating up his opponents in every fight. This guy is explosive. 29 knockouts out of 32 wins. Yeah, only Musashi truly, he said it to us, yep. dominated him. Well, we head now for the bantamweight. San Rivaldo Lima to Silva, the self-styled Camisa Pitbull goes up against a huge local favorite in the shape of Brian Moore. These Dublin fans build and build this atmosphere. And now to make his way to the cage, Arrivaldo Camisa Pitbull. So Arrivaldo Carnisa Pitbull played up to his nickname at yesterday's weigh-in by chewing on a bone. And he's going to need plenty of dog in him here against a durable, experienced and gifted opponent. He will bring fire, though, and this former punk band drummer brings a good deal of personality to what can he bring, though, I wonder, to trouble Brian Moore. Five-fight win streak makes him interesting. Look, he comes out to fight. That's the one thing when you're looking at Lima De Silva. He is a guy that will stand and bang with anyone. And he's going to get that opponent in Brian Moore. 
I think it's smart if he tries to take Brian Moore to the ground. I don't think he's going to do that. I think he's going to sling leather with him. And we're going to see who's going to come out on top. And they welcome him in. Michael Bay Doesn't have much time left for leaving things to chance. As he did against John L. Lugo, really. High level opponent, of course, but he was disappointed with that decision, but he didn't quite do enough. So tonight he'll be looking for something more definitive, a dominant win, a devastating stoppage. The Pike Man, it feels, is a man on a mission here. Brian Moore is a very good fighter. I call I call him my Irish Canelo, and the reason is he goes to the body so well. 69-inch reach to a 66-inch reach. That gives Brian Moore exactly what he likes, a reach advantage, and he doesn't get it very often. So that's the tail of the tape between the bantamweights Brian Moore and Arivaldo Lima da Silva. And here's Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight here at 3 Arena in Dublin, the prelims. Introducing the blue corner at five foot six, weighing in 135.9 pounds. His professional record 19 wins, nine losses, two draws from Arocaia, Bahana, Brazil. Presenting Arivaldo Carniso Pitbull. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner. Weighing in 135.7 pounds as a professional, 14 victories, nine defeats from County Wexford, Ireland. Introducing Brian the Pikeman Moore. In charge, your referee Kevin McDonald. There's a real transformation in Brian Moore, who's spoken so honestly about back, back, back. his mental health struggles. He's felt this week like a different man entirely. It's been great to see him in that kind of form. Spoke about the nightmare he had in Russia fighting Nikita Mihailov. He described it as trying to survive more than thrive. Well, tonight he's going to try and thrive, and this could be explosive. These two both like to let their hands go. Yeah, I would tell you right now. Back up. That is not the way to start. Over there, right over there. Hey. Just walk over here on your own time, away from your corner, okay? Here it is, John. A little bit off target here, brings it up right into the middle. Not a whole lot of movement by Brian Moore that made that happen, so. Take it down, bro. Now, Carnisa Pitbull making his mark early. And more okay. rightly given as much time as he wants, well, within reason All to right, recover. Continue. And we can kind of reset and start again here. And close that gap, Carnisa Pitbull. Pitbull looking to get into a grappling exchange. That's why he's swinging the way he is. Very square right now. Fight smart here. And that's been the message for him and the message coming from him as well. And 11 submission wins. Carnisa Pitbull. And over half of his wins have come by submission. Very strong, good body positioning on the ground when he if he gets it there. Brian Moore's been in these positions before. He understands the grappling well. He's not a guy that relies on the grappling. He's more defensive in his grappling maneuvers. And if you want to talk about a guy that utilizes a jab beautifully during the fight, Brian Moore is your guy. Yeah, those 11 
submission wins. Bear closer inspection, by the way, from Anissa Pitbull. Ten of them by guillotine. I mean, there's preferring a way of winning, and there's that. Right there, Brightmore thought when he caught that knee coming up, he had the leg, he could have elevated the Lima up and over. He decided, no, I don't want this on the ground, I want the stand up. A nice lower leg kick by Brian Moore. And beautiful movement. Look at see, notice how he's circling out away. There's no way for Lima to chase him down in that type of situation. So that's going to keep him safe. Very smart tactic. His hands nice and loose, carries that left hand low, Brian Moore. So Lima's taking a lot of chances here at the stand up. His hands are coming down. Facing a guy like Moore. Be very cautious of where he puts his hands. Well, there was sort of a range finding left hook there from Moore. He stretched a bit more with that one. He's having a look at that punch, Brian Moore. And there's another. There's good calf kicks. They will pay dividends eventually. Mixing it up well here, Brian Moore. Very nice. There, instead of circling, he ended up going straight back and get himself up against the cage. He needs to be very cognizant of. When I move, if I take the step back and then I take the next step out to the side. Spearing out that jab again, Brian Moore, and again there's that good movement. Got a good plan here, trying to execute it. Brian does a beautiful job of utilizing that jab. He'll throw a right cross and then a left hook to the body that is just simply poetry in motion. I love when he does it. That was a left hook to the head. Right now, Brian Moore's got De Silva. He's starting to guess, which means he's having problems with what Brian's doing. Look for that uppercut. He didn't miss by much, you know. Yep. Feels like Moore's trying to set Ronaldo Lima De Silva up here. And those kicks just keep his opponent off balance. The body, though, from. Anissa Pitbull. Nice straight right hand down the middle. Is he going to make Anissa Pitbull buy one of these fates and then follow up with something powerful? It kind of feels that way. That's what he's looking for. See it right there. That's that's beautiful stand-up fighting. You see him land the right hand, take a step back, measure range. You see Lima trying to land the counter, and it's just out of range based upon that footwork. Beautiful down. Great body shot followed up by the straight right hand. Just before that, he threw a jab to the body as well, then Moore, and that's an intelligent shot to use at this point. Good opening red, good high kick there from Moore. I'd be happy with hey, Ryan changed. Moore here. A few more pads if he's in auto. He goes south wide, you get the 3-2 more. That lead, lead up a button in the back hand, yeah? Okay. Everything else is beautiful. What's he throwing mainly? Sometimes you only have to look at the fighters' faces to get an idea how the round went. Oh. Then we can dip. Yeah. Back you take a look at just lead, lead the interaction with the coaches and, and the, the look in the eyes. Ball, it will tell you a lot of what happened in that last round. So round two. Okay, watch that. The local favorite, Brian Moore, against... And Evaldo Lima da Silva, if you're wondering about the name, he said he wants to be known as Carnisa Pitbull. Just feel the need occasionally to remind you, because what he's officially called on the, on the fight card is Lima da Silva. More in control, but 
His opponent's still very, very dangerous. He's born in Salvador, in Bahia, but he's living in Parana, down in the south of Brazil. Very nice job by Brian Moore. Stonewall that, which was actually a really good change of levels by De Silva. Jonel Lugo, he wants some happy memories at this three arena, Brian Moore. Again, you just sense that desperation. It doesn't mean it won't work well, for when the Brazilian. He's still dangerous. No, he's dangerous when you know, he's slinging those shots, but they're coming very wide. They're taking a long time to get on target, and Brian's able to see them and move out of the way before they get there. Some of Brian Moore's striking. You talked about it, poetry, emotion. It very it's a sharp. Short left hand there, but exactly. it's just a brilliant shot. Very, very sharp, very clean and crisp. He doesn't throw a lot of looping shots. Everything's tight. Nice hips. Here's the takedown defense from Brian Moore. Moore. done well here. And that was very nice by Brian Moore. You saw the Silva starting to get that underhook. That's going to help get him up. You see Moore reacting to it, Back putting up. pressure up, on up, him. Up. He's Let's the go. one deciding, OK, I'm going to get up and away. Go, he brings the Silva back to his feet. And that's blocked only with one hand. So yeah, it was blocked, but he's still feeling that. He's blowing a bit here, you know, Carnisa Pitbull. Starting to really tire those legs. We're getting a little bit heavy from the successful kicks as well. So are those arms. Moore's quicker on his feet anyway, but he's slowed up his opponent here. Still needs to be careful, though. that nice shot right to the body with the straight right hand a lot of power on it he nearly walked him onto a straight right hand there to the head Just didn't quite time it right blood to the nose now of the increasingly and beleaguered Brazilian. Still got just over a minute to go in round two. Another right hand, that lovely straight right, beautiful balance. And that first one landed with a lot of power because the silver was coming forward quickly on that. Moore landed a beautiful shot. Silver there was just trying to time. Moore's uppercut with a right hook of his own. Take a look at those strike stats right now. 44% connection rate, 48 of 110 by Brian Moore. 33 of 86 for Lima Da Silva, but the heavy shots have all been landed by Brian Moore. In the final 20 seconds of round number two here. So far, Moore has just looked better everywhere. Stop! Clean break.
Take a look at some of this action here. This is the shot where you saw Silva lunging in. Brian Moore catches him with that right hook. Just lights him up with it and then straight down the middle. You see his head popping back. Brian Moore was on target, landing at a higher percentage rate again in that round. So we head into the third and final round. They're getting their money's worth here tonight in terms of action. They're getting their money's worth. Behind the line for me, please. Thank you. Third and final, Jets. I'm duty bound to ask you any argument at all about how you would be scoring this quite clear. Yeah, I don't think anyone's, I don't think anyone's been given the rounds right now to Lima De Silva. Oh, look, look, he's been fighting hard. He's in there and he's trying. He's just being out technique by a guy who in the stand-up moves his feet well gives good feints nice head movement he's got good power in his hands so he's, he's diminishing him with every shot and he stayed busy as well here more so the cell is starting to he's starting to get a little bit desperate you notice how he's moving a little bit faster forward there's two two you know ways of looking at it I can try to defend and I'm just not going to win this fight or I'm going to go after him and he's put in his head I'm going to go after him. you give him credit for that he's going after him again yep. looking for that takedown it just wasn't there there's that right to the body again from more that thing has been money for him during this fight and that takes a lot of energy out of his opponent Anissa Pitbull deserves great credit for the spirit here. Yeah. You say, but not just lying down and accepting defeat. You know, for the body of his own there. It's just, it's just a true statement when you look at a lot of fighters knowing ah, I've lost both of the first rounds and, I, and it's just getting worse for me. I'm just going to try to make it through the fight. So the win is, oh, I made it to a decision. He's not doing that. He's going after him. He's trying to, he wants to end this fight. to see Brian Moore looking so good here after what he went through and his very public statements not just in the cage but all around it great work by Brian Moore you saw that De Silva had gotten his hands clasped you saw Brian Moore turn and actually give part of his back to him and then spin through changing the position great work One of those nights so far anyway where he's done pretty much everything right Brian Moore dealt well with anything that Carnisa Pitbull has thrown at him and he's done a lot of damage of his own and I know people come and they want those fireworks and they want the big dramatic knockouts the highlight real stuff but if you're a fan of striking Moore's been just lovely to watch. Poetry in motion, as John described it. Oh, get up. Stand. See, a lot of people are going to question, right? Why is the referee getting him up? That is Brian Moore is in control of that position. When he backs off of his opponent, that's telling the referee, I want him up to his feet. He's the one in control of it. He's the one that gets to decide. Now that cut to the, I think it's the bridge of the nose of Carnisa Pitbull. leaving nothing at all to question here and Lisa Pitbull needs a sort of Hail Mary moment here there is just a little cut to the right of Brian Moore's nose there suggesting that something has landed but it's nothing that feels like it's troubled him at all as we head into the final minute of the fight
lot of people will go and well, well, De Silva was aggressive. You know, why did we move aggression in the judging criteria down? It's because of this. He is the person coming forward, but he's not the effective aggressor. Brian Moore is the guy that is the best as far as controlling the aggression of the fight. He decides when the engagements that are effective are going to happen. That's a nice right hand. Again. And aggression means you've got to land as well, right? Yes, that's exactly. Effective aggression, not just coming forward. Oh, oh the uppercut there from Moore. He's been looking for that all night. He's got a good chin, Carnisa Pitbull. He took that well. He's taken a couple of good shots well. But Moore has been completely dominant here. It's been a really good display on the feet of effective striking, effective aggression. And Brian Moore and John Kavanagh with a big smile on their faces. We will make it official, but rather like a few of the fights tonight, I don't think there's going to be any doubt about that. Brian Moore knows, knows how good he was, knows how big the distance was between them. No shame at all from very tough opponent, Carnisa Pitbull. This feels like Brian Moore's Who got back. Worse? Who got worse? Him or Dave? 35 years of age now, but stay busy and he can still shoot for the stars, Brian Moore. What a night it's been for John Kavanagh. Prospects coming through and winning. Established fighter like Brian Moore producing a really good display. All smiles, Brian Moore. So Michael C. Williams is in position here, and we can get up to him now for the decision that just has a whiff of inevitability about it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we go to the judges' scorecards. All three, Brian Miner, Ron McCarthy, Eric Colon, see it the same 30 to 27 for the Winnipeg unanimous decision. Brian, the Buckman Moore. Brian Moore, it's great to see you smiling and winning, and we can hear from him now with Big John. Oh man, go on. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with Brian, the Pike Man Moore. Brian, that was an outstanding performance. John, I got one thing to say. Hey, baby, let the free birds fly. Love, shit, faith. <laughs> you use great footwork and beautiful combinations to control that fight no matter where it was going. He kept trying to take you down. You knew he was trying to do that. You kept. If it went to the ground, you kept getting him back up. What was your entire thought process during this fight? Well, John, I thought I won the last one, but I had to be more clinical in this one. I took your advice. I need to use more than just my hands. You've seen teeps and beautiful head kicks today. You've seen beautiful wrestling defense. I just beat the shit out of a veteran 3027. And I thought I fronted the greatest fucking crowd. Brian, you've always fought the toughest guys in here. You don't back away from anybody. Yeah. At 135 pounds, yeah. who should you be fighting next? Do you know what, Bellator? You've ever given me a taste for beating up these Brazilian bantamweights, so Leandro Huihigo, let's do it. Oh, that sounds like a good one to me. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the Pike Man, Brian Moore. You'd watch it, wouldn't you? You'd definitely watch it. So he calls out Higo Brian Moore, and he's full of that performance. All smiles from that SBG Island team. What a night for them so far. 
Well, let's tell you about our main card. Here are the light heavyweights, Carl Albrechtson and Carl Moore will kick off our main card here at Bellator 285. That one could be explosive. Albrechtson often overlooked Moore. Very, very good and back after a long layoff. The best of that main card now. Let's take a look at the rest of it. Kieran Clark, Rafael Utzen, kick us off. Mads Burnell and Pedro Carvalho. Of course, we'll have this crowd behind him. Liam McCourt, ditto for her, will take on Diana Silva. It's Yoel and Melvin. We've talked about them. And Benson Henderson, Peter Queeley is our main event from Bellator to Eight five. The action will just keep on coming tonight. So much to enjoy on that main card. Plenty too from the prelims. But now we focus on those big six. Bellator brings the brawlers to the raucous atmosphere at Dublin's three arena. Benson Henderson steps into enemy territory against hometown hero Peter Quilly. Plus, light heavyweight Yoel Romero is on a mission of destruction. But Melvin Manhoff wants to go out on top in the final fight of his storied career. I grew up eating carne asada at other friends' homes. Um, when I was younger, we didn't, we didn't have a lot of food at home. And so I used to go ask my friends if I can go eat dinner at their house. And uh, today it ain't like that. Today I'm able to provide for my family and I don't gotta live that way and they don't gotta live that way. And we all get together and I get to watch them smile and laugh and run around the park. I learned to cook from my best friend Carlos. I learned how to cook from him. So every time that we come to barbecue, I make sure that I invite him and he's, uh, he's more than friend, he's family. Chandler trying to lock in. Michael Chandler has this on a normal opponent. That would have worked. Oh, that right right hand hand. through. That is how Ben Henderson got knocked out by RDA in a scramble trying to get up. Michael Chandler just teeing up. Mamadov also has to maximize his positioning. And there's the roll. Nebo kept again by Henderson. Nice job by Adam Piccolotti. He's in a good position to just keep controlling. He's got that arm behind the back. Josh is going on that arm. And Benson. He cannot go for the guillotine from here. He's thinking about it. He is. He's cranking on it hard. Trying to submit the submission specialist. This would be incredible. How much energy does he want to devote to that? Now he's trying to crank on the neck of Benson. He is going for that Doris. Where, where Benson is at, he's going to have a hard time. Get this from being underneath. He just needs to create that pressure. He doesn't have it. We have that. Boom. Can he get it here with one minute on the clock? He is not going to get that choke there. He's got a great body triangle. What he should do right now is do not put this and spin within your legs. And that's what's happening. Benson is going to end up in Piccolotti's guard. Benson taking his arm and trying to extend his arm down to create a space between. Now he's taking his leg and bringing his leg into play with it. All smart defense by Benson Anderson. He is a physical unicorn. He is an absolute beast and just something that physically does not make sense. This guy is a monster. Just a bomb. 
think there were those that doubted Yoel Romero. Wow. One of the most ferocious strikers in all of mixed martial arts. There is Melvin Manhoff. Man, that is power, Sean. Another spectacular knockout win. No one's going to be any stronger than he is. No one's going to be any faster than he is in this way. Desperate to detonate a Cuban missile. That right cross. So many tools. So much talent. So much experience. That is just massive. It could not have ended any other way. Oh! By Melvin Mana, and it's over. Yoel Romero is a freak of nature. Man, they are looking to finish it. He does. Oh, that's it. Out. See you soon. Bye. He just wilted back and sat to his butt. And then Carvalho was able to get in there and 
jump in for the mount and the finish. Michael Chandler trying to lock in. Michael Chandler has this. On a normal opponent, that would have worked. Oh, great right 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 got through. That is how Ben Henderson got knocked out by RDA in a scramble trying to get up. Sure. Michael Chandler just teeing up. Mamadov also has to maximize his positioning. And there's the roll. Nebo attempt again by Henderson. Nice job by Adam Piccolotti. He's in a good position to just keep controlling. He's got that arm behind the back. This is the like Josh is on that arm. Not go for the guillotine from here. He's thinking about it. He is. He's cranking on it hard. Trying to submit the submission specialist. This would be incredible. How much energy does he want to devote to that? Now he's trying to crank on the neck of Benson. He is going for that Darce. Where, where Benson is at, he's going to have a hard time closing it off. Get this from being underneath. He just needs to create that pressure. He doesn't have it. We have that. Boom. Can he get it here with one minute on the clock? He is not going to get that choke there. He's got a great body triangle. What he should do right now is do not put Benson's spin within your legs. And that's what's happening. Benson is going to end up in Piccolotti's guard. Looking for one of the biggest victories. Taking his arm and trying to extend his arm down to create a space between. Now he's taking his leg and bringing his leg into play with it. All smart defense by Benson Anderson.